I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. Right now we are at the absolute pointy end of the 2022 federal election. And this is a really important election. National life-altering events have led up to this moment. The devastating black summer, the COVID-19 pandemic, and now economic uncertainty, global economic uncertainty, plus European conflicts and what seems to be a separating of views between us and our biggest trading partner. It's now up to us to decide which party is up to the task to get us through the next three years. Who do you think it should be? In a rare opportunity, the 30th Prime Minister of this country, Scott Morrison, joins me on the show today to sit down for an hour-long interview. I need to make this crystal clear, by the way, that as of this recording, that's the 10th of May, 2022, I have given the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, as same opportunity to come onto the show to talk about his policies and where he wants to to rebut anything that the Prime Minister's got to say. But unfortunately at this point, Anthony Albanese has not answered my invitation to come on the show. Hopefully that changes anyway, as I want to give him equal opportunity. But importantly, right now, we have the Prime Minister. So let's get into it. Prime Minister, welcome to Straight Talk. It's great to be back, Mark. Long time. Yeah, no, we've been a bit busy, but I'm, <laughs> I, I totally. wish we'd been able to talk earlier, but it's, it's great to be back. I want to say something to you. Yeah, okay. So every time I read about commentaries about this election, mm-hmm. these are the headlines. This is what I call the over-debated eight. Income tax, retirees, childcare, industrial relations, defence, education, borders, health. Done to death. We know what everybody's policy is. You know, we either agree with it or don't agree with it. But there's two things, two f- that I think have been missed out on that I just read. Mm. One is economy yeah. and the second one is small business or small to medium business, mm. which employs most of the country. Yes. And in itself there's a couple of million people sitting right there. Yeah. I want to talk about policies in relation to those two areas, the economy and small to medium businesses in mm. Australia. Can we just talk about the economy first? I remember in 2020 um, I had a conversation with the Treasurer and his office and they were talking about the sorts of things, incentives and et cetera, that were going to be done in relation to you know, putting money out there into the system so the banks could lend it to people and they could build houses and, you know, everybody can yeah. get along well, well. Is what we are experiencing right now a fact that you did too well during the pandemic? I mean, it's, it's a great thing to get, but <laughs> did you and your treasurer do too well during the pandemic? So much so that people felt a little bit too wealthy, maybe gone off and spent a little bit too much money, and we're just seeing a little bit of that in the last quarter. No, I don't think I'd see it that way. I mean, I, I think during the pandemic we, we worked hard to try and strike the right balance. And uh, but, you, know, you look back on these things in hindsight, um, but particularly at the time, what we were seeking to do was put a floor under confidence in the Australian economy. Um, the number of business, you would have had the same experience talking to people, your own businesses. Um, the level of uncertainty, the economic abyss, as we called it, that we were staring out into, the most important thing we had to do is tell Australians, it's going to be okay. You know, we've got to keep your business together. We've got to keep your employees with your business. We've got to keep the Australian economy intact because this was not a normal recession that we were facing. And, you know, it was a significant one. And we had a, we had a global downturn which proved to be 30 times worse than the uh, global financial crisis of, of around a decade or so earlier. And so what we had to do was inject massive confidence. And we did that through a range of different things. As JobKeeper, obviously, and the new numbers have come out on that day, saved over 800,000 jobs. And that was a really unique policy because what it did was exactly what you're saying, and this is how liberal governments do these things, it wasn't the government solving the problem. It was actually employers, it was banks. The government provided the environment for them to solve that problem because the the problem we had was we're expecting about 5 million people to need income support. And so it's spoken of as a wage subsidy, but that's not really what it was. There was no way the government system could get income support to all of those people quickly on time and people could have the certainty of it. So we said to employers, you pick those who you can keep on your team. Obviously, you're not going to pay them what you're paying them in wages. A fixed fixed rate. Go to your bank. The bank understands your business better than the government does to assess this. 
get the cash flow from them and we'll settle up with the bank. So it was a uniquely business, financial sector, government partnership that pulled this off. And so we did get that support to all of those people. It did give them confidence. And then the other thing we did, Mark, was particularly for small business, is we put in place those tax incentives um, which enabled them to go and invest in their business because they knew on the other side of the pandemic there were going to be opportunities should they be able to keep their business together. And every, The asset write-off. Yeah, the asset write-off. And everywhere I've been around the country, they, they do two things. They show me the new plant that they've bought, which can be everything from a fridge or a coffee machine or something like that, or a you know $450,000 lathe or something like that. The other thing they show me, it won't show me, they introduced me to the apprentices they kept. And the first thing that we did in the pandemic is we ensured they could keep apprentices by, we paid half their wage. Now, we now have 220,000 apprentices in train training right now. It's the highest we've ever seen since records began in 1963. They kept their apprentices so the skills we now need, which are in short supply, could you imagine if we hadn't kept the apprentices? The equipment that they've purchased and invested into their business, and this blew me away because it said Australians, if you back them in confidently as we did, then they respond confidently. And so I'm a bit excited about the opportunity ahead now because you know balance sheets were strengthened, household, which is the point I think you're making, together with business balance sheets, and we're ready to we're ready to go. But we can't take it for granted. Reckless financial management, reckless economic policy, it can pull the rug from everything we've been working towards. And you know better than anyone because you were the treasurer. Mm. When was 2015? When did you start off? I started in 15 and went through to, to 18, yeah. yeah. 15 to 18, you were the treasurer of the country. Mm. And um, in, that was uh, coming, out of, coming out of the GFC period. So there yeah. have been challenges during that period. So mm. you know what you just said, imp- how important it is for confidence yeah. for not only the business community but generally speaking all of Australians. Yeah. And as you said earlier, just a moment ago, Australian balance sheet sheets are in really good condition, hmm. really good shape. But there is a lot of people out there scared of the narrative. The narrative right now in the media is hmm. 300 basis points of interest rate increases. Hmm. That's, you know, 14 or 15 rate rises, assuming hmm. they rise a quarter of a percent of time. Hmm. Do you really believe that will have so many rate rises. I mean, based on today's data, maybe. But do you think that the behaviour won't change such that we will need to impose so many rate rises to control inflation? Or do you think Australians will respond like they responded during the uh, during the GFC, like they responded during the COVID period? Yeah. They responded. Well, it's a really interesting question. I mean, there is obviously upward pressure on rates now. They're at historically low levels at, at 0.1. They've gone up by 25 basis points. But, you know, in New Zealand they went up by 125 basis points. In a period of four months. It, exactly. And then we've seen in the US and, and Canada they're up at, at – uh, they're at 100 basis points now. Um, so they've gone up by 90 and 75. So – um, those monetary policy returning to more uh, regular settings was 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 always something that I think people understood was coming. And, and you would have seen this in your businesses where people have moved from variable to fixed rates. That's gone from 20 to 40%. The other one was the doubling of the level of mortgage buffer people have been mm. building up over the course of the pandemic. And so the, what the government was doing, Australians were doing. And mm. businesses were doing the same thing. They were preparing themselves. They were They knew that that those extraordinary policy settings we've had in place during the pandemic, of course, weren't going to be in place forever. So they prepared for it. And that's why I'm confident because I know what the Australian economy has done over the last couple of years. But on inflation itself, I mean, and the pressures that the bank have sort of got to look at there and manage, there are very temporary shocks to inflation and, of course, the war in Europe uh, being the most significant of those, um, massively impacting gas prices, energy price shock, you know, seen those sort of things back in the 70s and other times. That obviously has a big impact on inflation. The other big impact on inflation, which is more also temporary, I should say, is the shutdown in China. Um, and, of course, we've got the impact of the floods here in Australia on fruit and veggie prices and all those sorts of things. So we'll see those, um, I think, move through the economy. The structural impact on inflation, though, is about the supply chain, supply chain tightness and disruption we've seen as a result of COVID, but also because of geopolitical factors as well. Now, that has great risk for us in pushing up those prices, but it also has opportunities because supply chains will get more onshored in Australia, particularly in advanced manufacturing. I was a defence industry business uh, the other day in Perth. 
They have a supply chain manager. Their job is to get more of what they have in their supply chain produced in Australia. So, you know, there's threats and opportunities and in the right economic policy settings, with the right economic management, with the right keeping taxes low, ensuring that small businesses, and you and I worked together when I was treasurer on trying to get businesses digital online. Well, COVID sort of helped that along the way. It really did. Those sort of things are putting businesses in, in I think, in a space to really capitalise on that. So this is why I'm, you know, it's been a tough, really tough three years, but I think coming through it, we've come out stronger and our opportunities are right in front of us. How important do you think being treasurer for all those years has empowered you or put you in a position where you can actually talk like that, like you just did then, so confidently but with a good understanding? I mean, you're talking to someone like me, you can't bullshit me, right? <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. That's true. And, I was that And much. I can say what you just said and yeah. I'm not here to, you know, wave the liberal flag, yeah. but I can say what you said made complete sense. Yeah. So how how important is that to a prime minister? Oh, massively. And, and and not because I can talk about it but because, you know, you're sitting there. You imagine the day when Treasury comes in and says unemployment's going to go to 15%. Um, you know, youth unemployment's going to go even higher. Um, we can't get income support to everybody in this country. Uh, this was a pretty big day at the office. Now... It's one thing to have ideas, but the real challenge of government is not to have opinions about things. It's to know how you actually can do things in government. So, you know, I've, this last budget was the eighth I've been involved in. First one I just did as a member of the budget committee. Um, then I did three as treasurer and, and four as prime minister. When you do budgets, you understand all the mechanics of government and particularly the economic management machinery of government. That's why you, you don't go around spraying off about what wages sh- should be and, and speculating on that and you don't speculate on interest rates and things like Because you, you know the discipline of what a prime minister or a treasurer says can really impact on the economy and set expectations and have real impacts for people. So you're careful. You know, you, you, you're considered. You're, you're deliberative. And what, what I learned as a treasurer more than anything is you have to think through the consequences of your economic policies. You've got to be able to know how to do it. So JobKeeper again, it was one thing to work out that you need to deliver it, but how? So we sat down with the taxation office and worked through that with them for days and days and days and days about technically how was this going to work? How are the BAS forms going to work? You know, what were the IT systems going to stand up? As a treasurer and as a prime minister, you have to know the mechanics of how the government works. And that's why I think that experience was indispensable to equip me as we went into that pandemic because I wasn't guessing. I knew what would work and knew what wouldn't work. And uh, I think working together with Josh, who's you know outstanding policy technician, <laughs> as not just a, a great economic sort of thinker and, and, and understanding the economy, um, you, you've just got to know how this stuff works. And it's one of those situations where experience counts. Mm. We keep talking about the cost of living. Mm. You know, it's on the front of everybody's lips. You know, they're all talking about it. But really what we're talking about is how will our economy deal with the cost of living pressure. Hmm. So in terms of our economy, do you see it as a difficult environment for us as consumers, the economy? Or do you see the economy as being in good shape, which is the reason why interest rates have got to go up from the very low base, being in good shape? And therefore, let's just grind it out and work our way through it all. I mean, how do you see the economy? I I would see it as resilient, I think, is probably the best way to describe it. I mean, of course, there's lots of challenges. There there, there are. They're they're significant. And, you know, we've already talked about it. But there always is. There is. I would say they're heightened well above what, you know, we've seen in a long time. Um, you know, we haven't had a war in Europe for a long time and, yep. and you, you had the, the hangover from the pandemic and all the other geopolitical issues happening in the Indo-Pacific and the strategic competition between the United States and China and, you know, we've got, got a, there's a quite a few international balls in the air that are impacting not just on Australia but, but all countries around the, the world. things you don't control. They're things we don't control. So you've got to focus on what you do control. And that's why I think during the, uh, these last few years we've always focused on making Australia stronger, more resilient more capable. And what I've been excited about is how Australians have responded in the same way. They've made their sales resilient. They've made their balance sheet stronger. You know, they've thought about how they're managing their mortgage. They've thought about um, how they're retaining skills in their businesses and and how they're, I mean, you would have seen, I'm sure on your 
on, on your podcast, you've spoken about it. I mean, the adaptive capability of small businesses during the pandemic was phenomenal. People reconceived their whole offering in like at a couple of nights and then turned it round. And it was really hard. They weren't making much, but they kept it together. And I was at a, I was at a, a cafe down in, uh, in Nara yesterday and chatting to the owner there. And they said, "Yeah, it was really tough there for a while, but gee, everybody's back now. We're, mu- you know, we're doing we're doing much better now." And so they're starting to see the upside of it. And that's why we did what we did on petrol tax. We did that in halving the petrol tax because just as the Australian economy was coming out of this, we didn't want those shocks that you know, nobody's fault, the war in Europe and so on, to then knock them over again. So that's why we put that bit more support in to ensure the economy can move through those short-term impacts. But the structural things we're going to do with, ah, that's why we have got our programs in advanced manufacturing. That's why we have got the 120% tax deductions for training for small businesses to put digital infrastructure into their businesses and to train their staff. Um, It's why we cut the tax rate to 25% and why we've kept the instant asset write-off going so business, small businesses can get their prices down. One of the biggest ones is managing their energy costs. And we announced our $60 million Powering Australia program, which is all about grants programs that help small business, particularly those who have big energy loads in their businesses, to um, have infrastructure in there that can keep their costs under control. And then we have an advisory service there which can help small businesses understand what's the best deal to be on, what are the best uh, technologies I should be looking at. So we're just always looking at ways that we can help small business manage their cost base, keep their staff and uh, seize their opportunities. I went down the road here just prior to you coming in and I had yeah. a, a schnitzel at, yeah. um, and, a, and some potatoes at um, a place called Una's, a little small business down the road here from the studio. Yeah. And there was a dude. So you're not on the no carb diet. Right? I'm not on the no, <laughs> not today. And I just, and all right, I was, there was a bloke sitting there and he reckon, he knows me from yeah. some this place and um, I felt a bit of a rough diamond and he said yeah. to me, um, what's going on? I said, oh, well, I'm, um, I'm just having a quick meal here because I'm gonna, I've, I've got the PM coming. Yeah. And I said, I want to, I said, what would you ask him yeah. if he said, look, I don't work anymore so I'm retired. Mm. He said, but I get on my wife and he rang his wife up mm. and his wife works in real estate. Mm. And um, her, her was more a point as opposed to a question. She said, vote for the prime minister. He put it on loudspeaker. She, yeah. she said, vote for the prime minister. And by the way, I would have picked him dead set yeah. for a labor guy, right? Yeah. Vote for the prime minister because he has done wondrous things for the real estate industry. Not you didn't do it personally, you didn't do it specifically, yeah. but the way this housing market has kept, you know, like strong, yeah. through, especially during the through the COVID period, yeah, was a real for me was a real tribute to what the treasurer and yourself have done. Like yeah. that putting of money out to the banks, where they lended at one point nine nine fixed rates yeah. for three years. Mm. I've never seen in my whole career as lending money. I've never seen rates that low. Mm. and every person I've spoken to, in fact, I was on Channel 7 this morning and, and mm. Kylie said to me, she said, I fixed my rate of 1.89. Mm. They're sweet for the next three years mm. and they are all now feeling like they're super smart mm. and that's only a result of the banks getting all this cheap money. Mm. And, you know, I hate the fact the banks get cheap money, to be honest <laughs> with you, but, but at the end of the day, it served the right. It was extraordinary times. It, it served the right mm. objective yeah. at the time. There were many things we've done in the last three years, Mark. But pretty courageous. Yeah, that, that normally... Is, it's not what you would have done, um, it, but it wasn't. Uh, it was unconventional. So we had to consider other ways to achieve what our purposes are. And what were they? That people felt confident in their jobs. That people would get jobs. That businesses would be able to survive, and and thrive. On those housing ones you mentioned, there's of course the ones you talked about there with the, with the cheap money. But um, one thing I'm really proud, of, and I, you've dedicated a lot, pretty much all of your working life to getting people to have own their own home. In the last three years, through that the Home Guarantee Scheme and the Home Builder Scheme, the First Home Super Saver Scheme, and the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, which we set up to loan at very low rates to community housing organisations to build affordable um, housing for key workers, you know, police and so on, but also those who you know needed um, effectively social housing. We've got over 300,000 Australians able to buy a home in the last three years from all of those policies. The one I'm most excited about is the home guarantee scheme that reduced the deposit down to 2% for single mums. And 5% for non-single. And 5% for for other families. Now, when we designed that policy before the last election, we understood that prices go up. There's, There's... 
unless you're putting more housing stock into the market, then prices are going to go up. So the big challenge for people was they couldn't save fast enough to keep up with the prices. And so getting the deposit was the real obstacle because it was just always getting further away. So I said, we've got to take this down. So we, have, we basically underwrote the balance of the deposit. The banks were the ones who were making the decision about whether the person applying could pay back the loan. And of course, they're doing that on 300 basis points higher uh, than what the rates were, which was another APRA policy that was important to ensure lending wasn't going nuts and un, and was and not irresponsible over that period. APRA being the regulator. Yeah, the regulator, sorry. Yeah, so we put that sort of belts and braces in during those periods of low rates. So you know, if, if you know, rates continue to rise, well, people know they have that other buffer that they've been assessed against on their income. But what that meant is, I mean, I've spoken to young people who said, this would have taken me eight years longer to buy this house, which I was standing in with them. And I, there's nothing better, frankly, as a you know, as a, a prime minister or even or a minister, when you see a policy that has worked so well, but again, it wasn't the it was wasn't the government doing it all. The bank's still providing the finance. Yeah, the loan applicant is still paying the loan. We just focused on the thing that we could do, which was the underwrite, um, which ensured they could have a lower deposit. And that contrasts to this thing that Anthony's come up with with Help to Buy, which is a government shared equity scheme which at a federal level I don't support, never have, um, because the way it works is you've got to have with government schemes all these rules about people's income and so on. But the one I don't get is they have a rule which says 120 grand if you're a couple to be eligible. 90,000 if you're single. 90,000 if you're single. But let's say you get a, you know, a primary income earner is earning, um, let's say 80,000 or something like that and, and the partner is earning 30, they're working part-time. If that partner goes back to work full time, their household income goes over 120,000. They immediately become ineligible and they have to do one of two things. They've either got to pay Anthony the money back, <laughs> um, which could be 250, 300 grand, and take a mortgage out on top of the mortgage they have, or they've got to sell the house. Now, I have no idea why that works that way. Because with our scheme on the underwrite, once you qualify, it's well, yours. That's it. You don't revisit it. And so that just says to me, you know, when you see the government as the answer to everything and you don't think about and, – and they're going to assess those loans, by the way, about whether they do – not the bank. It's going to be the government. There'll be a whole bunch of public servants running around assessing people for, for equity in their homes, you know. And that's, I think, the big difference between us, myself and Anthony Albanese, is that I, I see the Australians, the, the economy, the businesses, I see – how we can make that work better for people rather than making government the answer. One of the interesting things about the behaviour of borrowers too mm. is that if we live in a, a rising interest rate environment, the first thing Australian borrowers do because they're so resilient, they'll go and get an extra job, work extra hours or, mm. you know, get another job or mm. save money. But generally speaking, they go out and get extra work. Yeah. And if they were on the example we just gave, we're earning $110,000 between them and they've got to go and earn some more money to pay the mortgage, that tips them over the $120,000 or exactly. the 90000 of their individuals. There's not enough focus. I don't like the scheme. I don't like his scheme mm. and I don't mind saying it. There's just not enough focus on what happens if. Mm. It seems like it's a quick draw McGraw type thing. That's the way I saw it. It was just, well, we better do something about housing. We can't do what the government's done. Yeah. We better go and do something else. Yeah. When it comes and there are to state what, schemes like this, by the way. And, but when it comes yeah. to what you did, yeah. Scott, yeah. when it came to what you did, you copped a lot of criticism. And I don't mind saying I jumped on one of your um, Instagram pages and yeah. someone was criticising you saying with falling house prices and incomes falling and inflation and all that sort of stuff, you've set people up for fa to fail, the borrowers to fail, the buyers to fail. Hmm. And I thought oh, I can't stand this anymore. So I made a response. I said the government's not lending in the money. No. It's the banks. And the banks are assessing them on a 300 basis point increase in interest rates. Yes. So and no one's going to get this loan unless – they have the income to support it. Correct. At whatever level it is. <laughs> so it's just a nonsense. But I wanted to ask you this. No matter what you say, you get criticised yeah. and you get hammered. Where does Scott Morrison find his resilience from? You're like excruciatingly <laughs> relaxed. But you are. I mean, you, and I saw this in 2019, the same yeah. thing. You're up against the wall. Yeah. Where do you get your enterprise from, entrepreneurialism, to run this country? You run it like an entrepreneur. Yeah. Where do you get that enterprise from? 
I mean, your dad was a copper. Yeah, Your yeah. mum was a housewife, yeah. a teacher or something, wasn't she? Yeah, no, she, she worked in, in admin jobs. I mean, okay. Yeah, so yeah. where'd you see it? Well, look, I just get what, what really charges me up. And that's what was one of the hardest things during the pandemic because I was pretty much locked up in Canberra for most of that period of time. I get all my energy from Australians. I mean, it sounds quite toy. I love Australians. I really do love Australians I, I, because – and I love them more having seen what they've done during this pandemic and the way people looked after each other, the compassion they've shown to each other. And that's where, where my belief is. It's actually in them. I, I was with a, a, a I was with Simon Kennedy today. He's our candidate out in in Benelong, and we were with a, a group of um, a whole bunch of multicultural communities. And I was sort of looking out of them, and I was thinking about their stories, about what they've overcome, the business they started. You know, people from ethnic communities tend to start more businesses than those are not. Um, they're very entrepreneurial, and so that's that's where I get my energy from. I get when I hear those stories. I was at a job fair today out in Western Sydney, and there was just people everywhere getting jobs. Businesses needing people, people coming and getting jobs. That's what really lights me up, Mark, because thinking about those ethnic communities, they came here for that economic opportunity and I want them to find it. And not just them, I want every Australian to find that. And I don't think that's going to be done by the government. It's going to be in a country where there's a strong economy, where people can invest, they can have a go, they can get that go and they'll, they can be their best selves, live their own lives, make their own choices. They'll get some of them wrong, they'll get some of them right. Um, and uh, for those who really need a help, well, of course, the government's there for them for that. But um, no, I, I, I get it, I suppose, Mark, just from loving the country I live in and, and they do just fire me up. And in this job, I get to meet probably more of them than most people do and that's quite a privilege. Of course, I've got my family and I've got my faith and all of that, which, you know, makes me, um, you know, gives me a good grounding. And to be honest, I'm pretty comfortable in my own skin. I'm, I think I'm reasonably self-aware. Um, I never think I'm the smartest person in the room. Um, there's always smarter people around and it's good to ask them questions and listen to them and that tends to be how I like to run things. Governments, I remember prior to you, I went and saw Joe Hockey and I actually had Joe Hockey in this week actually because mm. he's put out a book and stuff and oh, we yeah. had a chat and I reminded Joe of a conversation I had with him when he was treasurer. I went to see him about the bad behaviour of the banks in those yeah. days. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not trying to judge banks today based on a standard back then. Or Lots or changed. Season. Lots changed. But back then. And Joe's words to me at the time were, look, Mark, he said, we're a, a Liberal Party, Conservative Party, and we don't interfere in what goes on out there. We, we mm. don't have inquiries, et cetera. Of course, under your treasurership, we had the uh, inquiry, we had the Royal Commission into the banking in, mm. in Australia. Mm. And now we've, through the COVID period, we had a government thinking about people's welfare, mm. which is sort of a bit removed from where conservative governments ordinarily would be. Yeah. What influence does the Prime Minister have on government policy when it's traditionally conservative parties, liberal yeah, yeah. parties, aren't like that? Yeah. And, and you call the Royal Commission. Yeah. Well, look, on, on that and, you know, a lot was learned from that process and, you know, we didn't go in and do it to – sort of feverishly, I think it's fair to say. I, I think we, we well considered our position before doing that and defined it, I think, quite well. And a lot of positive has come out from that. I mean, we obviously didn't agree with what they said on the mortgage breaking thing. I never quite understood why they But banks' behaviour is much better now. Yeah, ba banks' behaviour is much better now. And I've got to say, during the pandemic, they've been fantastic. Yeah. They've been fantastic. Um, they've given people the room and space, whether they be business people or on their mortgages. And, and they have been a very important partner in how we've been able to manage that economy, going back to JobKeeper. I mean, Josh was on the phone to them pretty much every day. And let's not forget most landlords, I wish I could say all, but most landlords also did the right thing by their tenants. That was another big change we made during the pandemic and that helped small business get through. I, I had to have some pretty strong conversations with some of those big landlords, but we got there um, and that was important because we had to get everybody through together. But it was a very un, unreal time. It was a very unconventional time. And what was basically happening, and what this is what we had to understand, this was caused by a, a classic black swan event. I mean, it was like being hit by a meteor with the pandemic. Um, so the economic effects of that were not normal. And I mean, governments around the world shut their economies down. That, that itself is just, I mean, if you'd said that to me, we were going to do that three years ago, I would never have believed totally. you. And so that meant we had to do things because we'd effectively shut the economy down and the government actually had to provide that bridge 
which is what Phil Lowe talked about it as, that bridge to the other side. But this is the difference that's going on around the world, Mark, and I think this is a really important point. As Liberals and Nationals, we know when you've got to step in and when you've got to get out. Okay, so, you know, when we said JobKeeper now has to end, Anthony Albanese said it should keep going. He was wrong. He said that when JobKeeper ends, unemployment will go up. It went down because we knew the resilience that had been built up. We knew the, the improvement of the balance sheets uh, and what businesses were doing. And so when you have these rather unconventional interventions, you do need to know when to start, when to stop. And we, I gave a speech before we did all of this at, at the, the Fin Review Conference and I set out all the principles by which we were going to operate through the pandemic. And they were things like targeted, temporary, fiscally responsible, using existing distribution channels within government to achieve the policies. And there's a whole bunch of them. And that guided us all the way through. So as Liberals, it was unconventional, but that's now why we've been pulling back from all of those measures because it's now time as the economy springs back to life. And one of the signs of that, I just saw a cruise ship all pulled up in, 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 in circular key there. Wonderful to see them back. Another sign that the economy is coming back to life. Now we let the economy go. Now, there are others on the left wing who, who don't think like that. They love the time when government, this period where we're in there, you know, right in the middle of the economy and all of these sorts of things. And they think they got to build back better. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? Let's build back better. I've heard this from the lefties all around the world. What it means is this is, oh, before the pandemic, the economy was all wrong. It was all terribly unfair. So on the other side of the pandemic, We've got to build it back in a way which keeps the government at the centre of what we're doing. I could not agree, disagree with that more and I've argued that case and I get support from people like Boris Johnson and others at these forums going, no, no, we want business-led growth. Um, we want business-led economies. I don't want government-led economies. Um, we want entrepreneurs. You, you might have seen that ad that have been running against me about when I say it's not my job. What I was saying is it's not my job to tell people how to spill their money, spend their money. That's actually what the grab's from. That's how dishonest it is. Um, but it's not my job to tell people how to spend their money or to run their business. They're making their own calls. And that's what I know makes Australia stronger. It's funny. I remember um, many years ago when Malcolm Fraser was Prime Minister, yeah. he said, he, I think he quoted uh, George Bernard Shaw or someone like that. He said, life wasn't meant to be easy, but it can be a lot of fun if you work at it. But, of course, they took the last part out yes. and they just kept quoting <laughs> life is meant to be easy. Yeah, and yeah. they and they, they ran that against him as a in in terms of his um yeah. his oh, policy. It's the nature of sort of um journalists and politics, I suppose, and and your and your political opponents um on in on this occasion. I mean you answered the question by saying you got a good support yeah. within within your family yeah, and, yeah. and within your spirituality and yeah. and generally speaking, you know, you you love seeing Australians. I'm always in well. a better mood when the sharks win too. Well, that, well <laughs> I, I, I guess so, but and, and they're going great. They've got a great coach by Fitz. Fitz is great. Well, you know Fitzy well. I don't hang on Fitzy out of the roosters, but anyway, yeah. we miss him. We miss him a big deal. Yeah. But I want to know, do you treat Australia as a economically? Because mm. I know the treasurer's there, mm. but mm. do you treat it like a business? Is, is it a business to you? Because if it is, you're, you're the CEO of the biggest business in the country by far. Um, is it like I, that? I don't know if I quite conceive it that way because, you know, a business looks after their customers um, and, and government has to look after its people. Mm. I think those parallels hold up true. And I think the efficiencies of how you run a business um, is always incredibly important and you, and you do try and model that in, in terms of how you deliver services and run your IT programs and your employment policies and, and all of those. So I think that's a fair comparison. I think is a fair comparison on the entrepreneurial side of things. A good example of that at the moment is what we're doing with critical minerals and rare earths uh, processing and, manu and, and uh, mining in Australia and really going out there and seeking to set up new supply chains around Australian producers, linking them up with Japan and the United States and Europe. As in lithium, et cetera. Yeah, yeah yep. exactly. And and uh, because, you know, most of that comes out of China yep. and they have a bit of a, quite a stranglehold on the world market. But we've been sort of working with a lot of, quite a number of countries now for many years. It's what we're doing in the Quad, which is Australia, India, Japan and the United States, is trying to set up these other sustainable supply chains, which really can see our rare earth business take off. Um, but that's a very entrepreneurial thing for us to do, understanding what an economic opportunity is for Australia. We're doing the same thing with hydrogen. We're doing the same thing with carbon capture, use and storage. We've got 22 billion we're investing over the next 10 years through CFC and all of these various other organisations to ensure we're developing technologies because I think net zero by 2050 gives us the opportunity if we do it right, i.e. through technology, 
not by taxing everybody. Um, if we do it that way, if we work out how to transform our energy economy over the next 30 years, well, every single one of the developing countries around us wants the same technology. And I see if we can crack that, we will continue to be a massive energy exporter into our region as we always have been with fossil fuels. We will be in the future too. It'll just change over time, not immediately. It'll happen over time. If you try and force that change well before the technology, well, you, you basically sink your economy. And that's why I have a problem with the Labor Party's emissions reduction policy and, and uh, the more uh, the even more extreme positions like the um, so-called independents in places like Wentworth and others who, who are looking at 60% emissions reduction, which would just crash your economy. So it's true entrepreneurially in that. But I suppose at the end of the day, you've got to remember as a government, you're there first and foremost for the citizens and their welfare um, depends on pensions and various other things as a, as a, as a basic line of support. So there, I would say there are other, other measures you've got to measure yourself by, not just your economic performance, but I do know this, if your economic performance isn't on track, you can't do anything about aged care, disabilities, medicines, Medicare, those things suffer when you've got a government that doesn't know how to manage money and run economy, which is I think what the risk of labour is. Because that, that's what worries me, the argument or the debate between the, the two major parties anyway, gets reduced to welfare all the time. Mm. You know, what are you going to do for me? Mm. I, I need help. You know, mm. th that type of that argument, yeah. that's very much a Labor platform. Yep. I get it. Yep. But in a order dependence to, platform. Correct. But in order to have welfare managed, you've got to have, um, you've got to be progressive as well. You've got to actually have, the, the country's got to have, be doing well. It's got to be doing very well. And the balance yeah. sheet of the country's got to be good enough to be able to, yeah. you know, distribute You've this money the to those people. From. You, you, you got it, <laughs> totally. And so in your- A budget's a p and <laughs> At the end of the day, it is. It is, totally. It doesn't always pan out that way, like yeah. all of us with our budgets, but yeah. but nonetheless, you've got to have a starting point. Yeah. And, 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 you're, and for me, the starting point, you know, the, the, the recent budget that Josh Frydenberg put yeah. out, I thought was very responsible. Yeah. I, I, I got a lot of, I mean, he is, you, you describe him as a technician. Yeah. He looks like the sort of person to me that would pour over every single expenditure item and number. Yeah, he is. And Simon Birmingham as the finance minister, like Matthias before him, it's the same. That's just how we are wired as liberals. Um, we That's exactly what we do. Um, hour upon hour upon hour and what's called the Expenditure Review Committee, just pouring over these things, making the judgments between this program and that program, what's going to grow the economy. I mean, in the most recent budget, We've got a very big investment in regions in Australia because to pay uh, for pensions, to pay for all of the, you know, um, the things we need to do, then we need to be unlocking the wealth of the regions more than we are now. And that's not just in resources, but it's in a whole range of different areas. And we've put massive investments into the Pilbara, in what's called Middle Arm, which is down through the Northern Territory going to the centre, um, what's called the Burdekin region, which is central and northern Queensland and the Hunter. And we think by transforming those regions, we can a lot, unlock a lot more of the wealth that's in those regions and that will ge generate serious earnings for Australia because the money has to come from somewhere to pay pensions and the NDIS and Medicare. And, and I know that when Labor were last in power and they lost control of the borders, that, that blew the budget by about $17 billion from memory. And then on top of that, they had other budget nightmares and they, st they couldn't list medicines on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme and they had to cap defence spending. So when you can't manage money, you can be as passionate about Medicare as you like, and I am, and the NDIS, but if, if you want a guarantee on Medicare, well, make sure you've got a government that knows how to manage money and because when they can't, that's when things like that are undermined. So money management, so we've probably gone from cost of living yeah. to the economy, but maybe what this whole election is about right now, and if they don't like Scott Morrison, maybe look at him in the next term, <laughs> but right now it's the only time to look at what you, you've got to look at the facts right now. Mm. It really is about money management yeah. of the nation. That's the job. Nation building and money management. Yeah. That's where we're at right now. And and in an environment which frankly is more challenging than it was at the last election and the one before that, um, this is the most complex set of, I think, international global uh, circumstances we've faced and it's also true uh, for international security. Um, this is the most complex we've seen it in a very long time. And that's why 
you know, people may not agree with everything I've done or everything I've said or all of those things. And, you know, that's that's understandable in the years that we've been through. But I would say don't risk all that you've worked for, that we've all worked for together to get Australia into this strong position uh, on a Labor Party that you don't know, on a, on, a, on, a, on a leader of the Labor Party in Anthony Albanese who's never done a budget, not one. He's been in politics longer than I have. But they've never trusted him with a finance or, or economic portfolio, particularly a financial portfolio. And I just don't think Australia can risk that. I just don't see the upside in it. I see a lot of downside. And, uh, and I think that is a great risk that Australia just cannot afford. Do you ever sit down and say, wow, I wish I hadn't done that or said that? I mean, do you ever harbour regrets? Oh, sure. I mean, there's, there's lots of things. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you how many interviews I do every day. Um, and occasionally you're going to say things that you, you wish you hadn't. Um, and that's just being human, I think. Um, but there's a difference between that and I think what we saw from Anthony in this campaign. Mm. I mean, not knowing the unemployment rate isn't a failure of memory, and particularly when you thought you had, it had a five in front of it. Um, that's you, a, what we call in Australia Barry Crocker. Yeah, that you got to know that stuff. You really do have to know that stuff. And um, and if you work with it every day, like Josh and I do, um, th- this stuff be, is instinctive and. With what we have to manage, it requires, you know, there's, there's no time to learn on this job. There's, that is a great risk um, and that's certainly not what Josh and I do. We, uh, we came into that crisis, you know, quite steeled already, quite prepared, quite across um, how government works uh, and, uh, and I think we got the best out of our public service during that period of time as well. I thought also did a great job and they'll give advice but – they don't make the decisions. We're the decision makers and we have to be able to weigh all that up and we did that all the way through the pandemic. I mean, same on the medical advice that we're dealing with in the pandemic. I mean, I listened to the chief medical officer every every time but he understood that at the end of the day for those things I was responsible for, I would have to make the decision. I, I used to watch that because it was always in front of us. Mm. I used to think to myself, how is the PM putting up with this national cabinet? Um, <laughs> I mean, it would have been tough because like you got uh, – you got, you got, Labor premiers, yeah. you know, and by definition they're going to say things and you know, they're not necessarily going to fall in line yeah. and it's a tough thing to manage, yeah. tough thing to run. Uh, would that have been one of the most challenging things that you've ever done in your prime minister well, period? Yeah. Oh, there's there's many but I, certain, I think that would be in the mix. Uh, but it was necessary because we had to – I mean the, the challenge was is most of the things that you had to do to manage the pandemic weren't – Commonwealth responsibilities. The federal government had no responsibility for them. Things like um, uh, uh, public health orders about what people could do and they were all state level. Mm. And particularly in the early part of the pandemic um, when we really had no idea about how bad this thing was and what it could do, we all got together and I made sure they made, were making decisions together. Now as time went on, the pandemic took – a different course in almost every different state. So the idea that the rules would be absolutely the same in every state and territory, I mean, in Western Australia, they didn't have any of it up in the Northern Territory for quite a while. They've got it now. They certainly got it now and eventually it was going to come to everybody but they're all moving at different paces. So the idea that everything would be the same I thought was pretty unrealistic. The idea that all states and territories are all going to agree all the time I think is also pretty unrealistic. But i got to say that on balance, it was a really important tool to ensure how we manage the pandemic um, proved to be successful. Didn't mean we had always agreed and there weren't difficult discussions. There were. But what was the alternative? Not talk to each other, um, not work together. Um, on the, when you play the percentages on it, um, then I thought it was a, a very effective mechanism and I think it will be more effective in the future. Um, once we get past the pandemic agenda, which has really dominated it. I mean, I, I mean, we did work on it on occupational licensing um, across the, the country during that same time. We did work on um, streamlining transport regulations between states and territories. We established uh, the Job Trainer Program, which established about 480,000 training places during the pandemic. Um, and we, we worked that out in two weeks. Um, so it, it got up some bad press and it got a bit of a bad rap. But those of us who are on it, I think all of us believe strongly that it, that it played a positive role and really helped Australia get through. You're still a relatively young man, certainly from my point of view. You are. <laughs> Where do you get your energy from, like uh, your and your capacity? You, you know, you, you cover so many areas; it's ridiculous. I mean, you've had to learn a lot over the last couple of years. I mean, a whole lot of new stuff: hmm. pandemics, yeah. pandemic management, 
economic management around pandemics. You know, now you've got China, you've got defence issues, yeah. you've got, you know, everything else going on around you. How many hours of sleep do you get a night? I actually don't do too bad on that because I'm actually fairly disciplined about it. Um, I, I try not to get any less than six. Because you've got to be, you've got to perform every day. You've got to be on top of it every day, and so I'm pretty disciplined about that. Um, but you look younger than you did when I interviewed you in 2019. I don't know how. I don't you, think that's true. It's true, mate. <laughs> I that's think serious. That's true. No, but I'm, I'm just looking at I you. Try I'm not and looking swim. at you. I, I, I try and swim. I haven't got to swim in for a week or so now, but that's important to me because that gives you a rhythm. I mean, you, I think yep, you, yep. you do the same thing. Um, and particularly on the other side of 50, you, um, your knees can't do other things. So yep. uh, the swim I find quite therapeutic. Um, my, 40 I love, as you know, and that's a great release for me, um, particularly when the girls come with me. Um, but look, the other thing is if you do what you love, it's not really a job, is it? Except, except <laughs> I'm, wor- I'm just I'm, – what I'm talking about here is mm. how do you keep your energy levels up? I know you love it, but mm. as you say, six hours sleep. I can, I can only imagine right at the moment mm. you're going from appointment to appointment to appointment. Yeah, you yeah. probably start at six in the morning and probably finish at 11 yeah. at night. Yeah. And you're going to do that for you do that for you'll do that for a six week period. Yeah. What happens at the end of six weeks? Do you go, oh my God, it's over. I'm finished. Well, well, to be honest, the campaign is not as demanding as governing. Is that right? <laughs> That's right. I mean, uh, this is why I said the other day: if Anthony thinks the campaign's hard, he, um, he's got I've got news for him. Government's a lot harder. Really? And if you can't um, actually get through the pressure of a campaign, well, you've failed the job application. You shouldn't even get a second interview. Um, I mean, when you're in government. Things happen from early in the morning to late at night and it just goes from one thing after the other. Now, when you're in a campaign, the government's in caretaker mode. Um, so all that normal routine of decisions and of these sorts of things, that doesn't happen, um, you know, under the conventions and under the constitution. So um, it is a different sort of arrangement. Yeah, there's a lot more public activity and you're doing that all day and that's true and that obviously um, takes it out of you. But I, I enjoy a lot of that too at the same time. But the demand of running government is, I mean, is, is far more... Uh, far more high paced, and uh, and you and you're moving between so many different issues all the time, and that's why you've got to always try and be, you know, on the top of your game. Um, Joe Biden's discovered how hard it is. It, it, it is. I mean, it's it is, not campaigning. It's government's different. Go, governing's not hard. It's un, it's unrelenting, and you never know what's coming the next day. And I, the way I've managed it is, I've had a very good, strong cabinet process, and I got great ministers, and I you know I run the government through the cabinet, um, through its various organs, which is, you know, the National Security Committee, which meets very frequently dealing with all those big issues. The Expenditure Committee runs through all the uh, uh, the, the budget and economic policies regularly. And then there's another one I established, which is always looking at regularly the implementation of our policies. How are they going? How are they tracking? How do we need to fine tune them? Um, did we get the budget estimates on them right? Are we able to move resources around to make that program work even better? And as a sort of a sort of relatively detailed minded person, and uh, someone who has a, a naturally inquisitive mind, I, I really do um, uh, enjoy um, that element of the job of, of working through details. I mean, if I have, I mean, I'm sure I've got many weaknesses, but because I've got quite a problem solving mentality, sometimes that can come across as being a bit lacking in empathy, but I'm a bit, okay, there's the problem. Let's understand it. How are we going to fix it? Because I just see that as my job to go and fix those problems and deal with those longer term issues doesn't mean I don't feel passionately about it. I mean, some of the most difficult jobs you have is when you have to, and not have to, but when you, you know, when you have conversations with you know parents who have lost children, um, either in terrible disasters or you know, um, including defence force um, personnel who've taken their own life. That's that's the hardest day in the office there is. So do you work seven days? In your yeah, job? you do. You do, and not you know, 24-7 every day, but the job never stops. Um, and that's okay. That is the job. I, I know what I signed up for and uh, it's a great privilege to do it. It's the great privilege, professional privilege of my life and it's something that I've given everything to, to doing. And I think as we go into this election, um, I think our government has acquitted itself against um, some of the biggest challenges any government has had to face since the Second World War and the Great Depression. And uh, when you look at where we are today and where we could have been, which you can see in other countries, an economy that has 400,000 more people in work than before the pandemic, growth rates that are in excess of all the other G7 countries, a AAA credit rating, a budget that's turning around, 
you know, unemployment at 4% and falling. And the one that cheers me more than anything else is youth unemployment at 8.3%, lowest level since um, in about 14 years. You know, you get a young person in a job, you change their life. That's that, the most important thing is getting young people in jobs because I know as a social services minister, the chances of someone staying on welfare their entire life or be, you know, income de- income provision dependent over their life goes through the roof if they're not in a job by their early 20s. That's when the, the work habits are really entrenched. And if you can get a young person into a job, into an apprenticeship, that's why when I saw the pandemic coming, I just said to Josh, we've got to keep these apprentices in these jobs because if they get knocked out now, you know, 18-year-old, Will they come back? I couldn't be certain and it was the first thing we did. And so when I go into those businesses and I meet those apprentices, my smile is from idiot. Is there anything or is there something that really tugs on your heartstrings as being a Prime Minister? Is there anything that that really gets you? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, oh, there's lots. I, one of them I was just <laughs> telling you then but i got to tell you the one that really gets me is when I meet – the, those Australians who benefit are from the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. When we put drugs on that program, and it could be, you know, one I've had quite a bit to do with spinal muscular atrophy, which is a terrible condition. Um, there's cystic fibrosis. There's so many. Um, it's breast cancer and other forms of cancer. When you meet the people for whom some of these courses of treatments were costing three hundred thousand dollars, and now they're under our policy, we we'll get it for thirty-two bucks fifty. This is life changing, and to think that something that we do as a government can make that transformation in a person's life. There was one it was Trikafta, which was a, I think if I've got this right, that's Greg Hunt remembers all the names of the drugs far better than I do. Um, but a Trikafta, I think it was, and and that is a cystic fibrosis drug. And I met a young woman up in the Central Coast the other day and she's had cystic fibrosis since she was a kid. And her and her husband had been trying to have kids for some time but, but the cystic fibrosis had really impacted on her and they were having terrible difficulty. This went on the uh, PBS. Three weeks, she's having, they're having their first child. Wow. I was, you know, that makes up for every bad day. It makes up for every challenge, every sleepless night knowing that in a country like Australia that happens and I know if you want that to keep happening in a country and for Australia to be like that, there's only one way to achieve it and you've got to have a strong economy. If you don't have one of those, you're just making stuff up. Because you've always got to pay for it at the end of the day. Exactly. Right. Welfare has to be paid yeah. for. Yeah. Um, Prime Minister, I, I'm conscious of the time. You're right. Um, I, want, I, I want to make one statement. I've always said that ex-treasurers – or former treasurers always make great prime ministers and or premiers mm. and we've seen that across Australia. Yep. In your case, you've got yourself and you've got a great treasurer. Yeah. You've got a great team. Um, I want to wish you the very best of luck. I think you're the man for the job and Prime Minister, thanks very much for coming here and speaking to me at Straight Talk today, mate. Well, thanks, Mark. I've really enjoyed catching up with you and perhaps we'll catch up in a few weeks' time because it's uh, – When it's done. It, it sh- it's Sharks Roosters down at Shark Park. You betcha. <laughs> well, last time we did that was the sh- Sharks Roosters at uh, our home game. It was yeah. the Sydney Football Stadium and unfortunately we, we got the chocolates. The Roosters got you the did that the day. day. Yeah, and, I, and, 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 I, I, and I hope you bring your daughters along yeah, like you did last time. We did. That'd be great. Good to see you, mate. Thanks, mate. Peace. Peace.